Uh, good morning. Can I welcome members of the press and public to the 14th meeting of the Public Audit Committee in 2015? Uh, can I first of all ask all those present to ensure that the electronic items are switched uh, to flight mode so that they don't affect the work of the committee? Uh, colleagues, can I refer you to agenda item number one, uh, which is a decision on taking uh, business in private? The question is that we take agenda items number five and six in private. Are we all agreed? I can refer you to agenda item number two, which is the section 23 report managing ICT contracts in central government, an update. Can I welcome our panel of witnesses this morning? Can I welcome Sarah Davidson, the Director General of Communities, uh, Mike Nielsen, the Director of Digital, uh, and Maxine Reid, uh, Head uh, of Office, uh, Chief Information Officer and of the Scottish Government. Uh, I understand that Sarah Davidson would like to make an opening statement. Thank you very much. I welcome the opportunity to provide evidence on the Audit Scotland uh, report managing ICT contracts in central government, an update. Um, the convener's already introduced my colleagues and we hope to be able to assist you this morning in your consideration of the Auditor General's findings. I should say at the outset that the Scottish Government welcomes this report and accepts the recommendations in it that are addressed to us. I'm here today to talk about the recommendations in the report that relate to the Scottish Government and not to the specifics of individual cases where there's a separate line of accountability. And my comments are therefore going to relate primarily to the first two sections of the report on strategic oversight and on skills. These are complex and interrelated issues and on each, as the report indicates, our approach has been to put in new arrangements and then to review and improve upon them in the light of experience. Indeed, in the five months since the audit work was completed, we've made more progress in this process of continuous improvement, and I want to update the committee on that in these brief remarks. Dealing first with the strategic oversight, I think it's important to be clear what the assurance framework is intended to achieve and, crucially, what it cannot. Clearly, the central government sector is taking forward a wide range of IT-dependent business change projects, and the IT assurance framework cannot provide specific assurance on each project. Rather, it's intended to assure that appropriate assurance arrangements are in place and are being used for each project. There's a crucial point here, which is that responsibility for the effective governance and delivery of individual projects lies with the senior responsible officer and the accountable officer. And it's essential that the oversight arrangements do not in any way cut across the clarity of that responsibility. Nonetheless, we absolutely accept the leadership and support role in central government and wish to ensure that this adds the maximum possible value to our sector colleagues in their planning and delivery of programmes and projects. As the report confirms, we responded directly to the recommendations of the original report in 2012 to introduce new assurance and oversight arrangements, and we've made significant improvements to those already in the light of experience, including creating the Office of the Chief Information Officer, reflecting the need to devote more resources to the implementation of the framework. At the heart of this development is a far more proactive and relationship-based approach, and feedback from colleagues suggests that this, along with the simplification of guidance, structured sharing of lessons learned, and investment in networks has been welcomed. It's clearly important, though, that we continue to monitor the effectiveness of these enhanced arrangements, and as chair of the Strategic Corporate Services Board, I have asked the Chief Information Officer to provide the board with an update report in the spring, including an assessment of the quality of relationships across the sector. This will be informed and supplemented by some random checking of individual projects which have not otherwise come to our attention via gateway reviews, and we'll also conduct a gateway review of the framework itself in the course of next year. Part two of the report dealt with digital skills, which, as the committee knows, is a big and complex issue with a range of players involved across all sectors. We know that a lack of relevant skills is a recurring issue for public bodies. It's also a major issue for Scotland's businesses, and the market for these scarce skills is highly competitive. The Digital Skills Investment Plan produced by Skills Development Scotland is tackling this for Scotland as a whole, and key priorities include the establishment of a Digital Skills Academy called Code Clan to rapidly increase available skills, and also a multi-channel marketing campaign to target school pupils, among others. And this is trying to create a more positive perception of technology as a career choice. Our work on public sector skills sits in this wider for Scotland context and we're taking a number of actions ourselves including more creative approaches to recruitment in order to meet our own skills needs. 
In light of our work on public sector skills uh, and the intelligence gleaned from our skills gap survey, we've established the Central Government Digital Transformation Service, which was formally launched last month. And this is intended to provide a source of digital skills to support ICT and digital projects, particularly in that crucial early scoping phase. Good progress has been made establishing this team. We've got 13 out of 25 posts already filled. There's a pipeline of work identified, and we're just about to invoice for our first chargeable item of work. We agree with the Auditor General when she says that this is an ambitious bit of work, but we're not deterred by that. And the central government sector has strongly welcomed this development, and we will again want to keep a very close eye on the extent to which it meets needs as it grows. Finally, bringing these two strategic issues back together again, we've also revised our governance arrangements since the publication of the Auditor's report. The Central Government Digital Transformation and Assurance Board is now responsible both for strategic oversight of central government ICT programmes and also for the Digital Transformation Service. And this brings together the oversight of both transformation and support. In other words, the assurance role of the Information Systems Investment Board, ICIB, which is referred to in the report, has now been vested in this new body. I hope that these comments serve to underscore the extent to which we are actively committed to this process of continuous improvement, and I'd like to assure the committee that we'll continue to iterate in the light of feedback and, of course, including any advice which comes out of our discussion today. OK. Uh, thank you. I'll now open to questions. David Taunts. Um, good morning. Could I ask about the skill shortages? And, and I know the public sector and also the private sector are struggling to get people into IT. Can you um, tell me a progress has been made by the Digital Transformation Service, please? Yeah. So the, trans the Digital Transformation Service is intended to address the skills gaps which we identified within the central government sector. And in particular, it identifies the need for people with skills to support central government bodies in the initial scoping phase of projects. So people who are able to come in and help analyse business plans, um, and able to um, ensure that people are um, putting the right skills in place at the early stage of a project. Um, as I said a moment ago, we have already um, appointed 14 people to new roles, and we are talking to 35 uh, bodies about, so we're talking to bodies about 35 projects which might be opportunities for our support. And along with that, we're developing case studies of the ways in which we've already supported bodies, so we can use that in order to um, explain the value that we think the, the service can add. We're developing the range of um, services which the service can offer, so initially we'll be reviewing and developing an organisation's whole digital strategy. We'll be um, revelop developing and reviewing business cases for services, but also critically there will be access to actual bodies who can come into organisations and can help them either in a shorter or longer term to develop an individual project. Sometimes that will be in-house staff and sometimes a digital transformation service will be able to source contractors with particular skills where it can be applied to um, projects and programmes. So, as I say, it's early days, and one of the key things that we will have to um, help the service to do is to prioritise where it puts its resources. But so far, we believe that this is the best possible answer to the gaps that have been identified and the difficulties that particular smaller bodies have in skilling up in order to deliver programmes and projects which may be outside their normal flow of work. Can I just mm. ask for just the most succinct answers Sorry. as possible, of course. please? Yeah. 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 Yes. Could you, um, you tell me how many public bodies you're supporting just now? Um, we're initially having discussions with uh, about 35 opportunities. Um, I'm not certain whether that is within 35 bodies or some bodies would have more than one opportunity. Between 20 and 25 bodies. Right. So that, that kind of number. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mary Scanlon. I'm actually quite shocked at the, the pitch you've given today and I'm wondering if perhaps you've read a different Audit Scotland report to the one that I've got. Um, can I just say that in a response from Paul Gray in October 2012, he promised we are working towards an action plan for central government ICT workforce to be available across the sector 2013, etc., etc. And that was to look at the skills gap survey. The Auditor General's report uh, this year, and I quote, Information Systems, ICIB, which was to oversee the implementation, did not have sufficient information, didn't have the capacity to perform the role effectively, it did not receive all the ICT investment and assurance information required from central government. 
You've actually come along and given us a pitch here today as if there's nothing wrong. This was promised to this committee in October 2012. You didn't get round to it until August 2014. So why did you encounter difficulties? Why did you not perform a skills gap until 2014 and it was promised in 2012? Within, within your comments, um, I think there are two separate issues. One is about the skills and one is about assurance and oversight. Um, as I think Mr Gray indicated when he came to the committee in 2012, we were already putting in place arrangements to look at both of these issues, um, but very much in the spirit of learning as we go. And as we have acknowledged, we didn't get the oversight and assurance perfect first time. Um, and indeed, I think Mr Gray said when he was with the committee that this was something that we were going to have to keep revisiting and learning from feedback. So while we did put new oversight arrangements in place, including um, learning from the Audit Scotland checklist that was included in their 2012 report, we also, from the very outset, gathered feedback from bodies about the extent to which that was delivering what they needed and was clear and comprehensible to them. And on the basis of that experience, after allowing a year or so to learn from that being deployed in practice, we revisited and improved the framework. So I wouldn't want to create the impression that nothing was happening during that time, because it was, but we absolutely acknowledged that it wasn't perfect first time and we had to improve on it. I think on it the... was far from perfect. It took you two years to perform a skills gap survey. I was just going to come on to, to pick up this, the point about skills. And you need the skills yeah. in order to do every... If skills aren't there... Can't happen. Absolutely, and we, we accepted the finding of the Auditor General in 2012 that, that skills were critical. You never did anything and for two years. Well, in in uh, the Audit Scotland recommendation of 2012, what they asked, that suggested that we should do, recommended that we should do, was undertake a strategic review of current ICT uh, skills availability. And again, I think Mr Gray said when he came to the committee in 2012 that we'd actually already started work on that building, on the benchmarking work which we'd already been doing in the context of shared services. And Again, that was an iterative process. We looked at what information that gave us about existing skills, put that together with the information that we had through continuous development, uh, professional development for the IT profession, and concluded on the basis of that that the existing information we had, although it told us quite a lot about our current skills, it didn't tell us everything. And well, ultimately, I, okay. well, ultimately, through that and the assessment of a feasibility of a skills bank, what we concluded was that assessing our existing skills wasn't going to give us all the information that it required. And that was when um, Skills Development Scotland commissioned the public sector-wide okay, skills survey. Okay, so you've survey. had three years to assess mm -hmm. your skills. Mm -hmm. You've responded directly to the report of 2012. That's not true. Mm -hmm. That's not true. And what you said in your opening pitch, which was incredibly confident... Positive perception of technology. Mm -hmm. Well, I also sit on the Education Committee, mm -hmm. and yesterday we were taking evidence about, in the last two years, for national fours and fives, there's been a 29% drop in presentations. So if you're doing a skills survey and a positive perception, if they don't get their national four and five, they don't get their higher, they don't get their HND, and they don't get their degree. So if you're sitting here with this big, confident pitch that you've got, Things are getting almost a third fewer presentations for commute, computing courses. And you expect me to say, can you understand why I'm a bit aghast and shocked at this confident pitch? And also, as if a 29% fall in national fours and fives in the last two years wasn't bad enough, and it came from the learned societies, and I certainly wouldn't question them, you've also had 24,000 fewer places at FE colleges. That's not doing degrees at FE colleges. That's just HNCs and HNDs. So I actually find it very difficult to believe anything that you've said this morning. So if you're doing a skills gap survey, you've had three years to positively, a positive perception of technology. So tell me why there's such a fall in computing teachers and ICT teachers 29% fall in national fours and fives and 24,000 fewer places. And I could go on, that's a, just a little snapshot. Why is all that happening? And you're, you've got a positive mm -hmm. perception. So, you're, you're, of course, absolutely correct about the complex, correct. Um, interlinked nature I of this. I wasn't correct. And, um, and, and it's an illustration that the, the, the uh, education components is an illustration of the fact that we have to look at skills in the whole and we can't look at the public sector skills in a way that's separate from the need to I get the whole system right. Um, 
there is a lot of work going on at the moment through colleagues in Education Scotland and the uh, Scottish Funding Council in addressing the types of issues which the Education Committee was, was looking at. And um, I know that Education Scotland have uh, a plan for digital education which looks at learning and teaching computer science and the curriculum and qualifications in computer science and uh, teaching opportunities in relation to that. And um, the, issue, the point I was making about perception of technology, it, it, it was to identify the fact that we recognise that there's a problem at the moment in the perception that young people have of careers and uh, courses in information technology and computer science. And one of the th our early actions which has been taken under the uh, National Skills Improvement Pl Programme is to do a multi-channel um, marketing campaign aimed very much at young people who are thinking about career choices in order to change their perception of computer science as both a school choice and ultimately a career choice. So all of those things are part of the mix when we're thinking about um, skills for Scotland and public sector skills within it. Okay. Yeah. I, mean, I know this area is a really very difficult one. People, you know, finding the solutions is not easy. Um, but. It, it does seem to me there has been an undue delay between the original report in August 12 and now in terms of the, the superstructure. We've already considered the skills gap. But, you know, you've come before us today and you've said, right, well, that didn't work. We're now going to change it. The ISIB, Information Services Investment Board, is now to be, what, dissolved? I mean, we've just, you know, heard that you were trying to sort out the roles of the Office of Chief Information the Office of the Chief Information Officer, who was to support the ISIB, but we heard in the report, the update report, that the split of roles and responsibilities hadn't yet been finalised. That was paragraphs 35, Exhibit 5 on page 15 of the report. Now you're telling us you're going to change the structure again, completely. Now, you know, I just don't understand why the system that you did set up... Uh, I understand why it wasn't given the information, and, and uh, Mary Scanlon's already alluded to that. But it still won't work if you haven't got the skills there. But, uh, you know, I just don't understand why you've come before us and said, well, that didn't work. We're going to have a completely new setup. It, you know, this doesn't seem to me to be a solution. And the proof of the pudding at the end of the day is what actually is happening in the cases. You know, because it's the oversight and supervision of that at the highest level that tells us whether these problems are picked up and, and uh, uh, Tavish Scott will refer to this in detail later. But they, you know, if you go through NHS 24, the CAP Futures Program, the Police Program, and, and there are 200 programs between 1 and 5 million out there, and we don't know anything about them. You know, the, the whole sector seems to be completely filled with overruns in terms of time. Uh, and, and, and frankly, talking on the medical side now, IT that comes out the other end that is not fit for purpose. Um, the clinicians on the front line are telling me that the NHS clinicians are, are important. So could, could you tell us about the oversight yeah. arrangements and why it's been changed? You know, what, what happened to the original one? Why did the ISIB not work? So I wouldn't want to overstate the, ch the changes in, in governance. The um, ISIB will continue to operate, but it will focus on the uh, management of programmes within the core central government, which it's itself has commissioned and funded. Uh, the creation of the uh, Central Government Digital Transformation Assurance Board was intended in part to address the issue that the Auditor General has identified of the importance of getting the balance right between the scrutiny function and the support function by bringing those together consciously in one place. It also recognises that there is a very close... Well, just not, so is, is it to deal with non-governmental programmes? No, it will deal, it will deal with... Um, central government sector programmes, in other words, not Scottish Government Corps, right. although the Scottish health Government Corps will report example, into that. Uh, not, not, not prison health, but, service or... But, yes, so uh, non-departmental body, public yeah. bodies uh, and associated bodies. And part of the value of bringing them together in this new form of governance is that there is a very close and symbiotic relationship between the oversight and the Digital Transformation Service, and it's those two things that will be governed together, because we will be expecting the Digital Transformation Service to be providing support to those bodies which are you know, possibly less experienced in taking on projects or are taking on bigger and more complex projects. So by bringing together the place where people in, uh, ensure that everybody has got the assurance mechanism in place and the bit of work which is supporting individual bodies to deliver programmes and projects, we would hope to get a far better 
governance process. It's also more efficient because otherwise you'd have two separate bodies asking for exactly the same information from the same projects about, about what they're doing. So that's the thinking behind that. Again, we'll keep it under review, but it reflects the establishment of the Digital Transformation Service, which wasn't there previously. So is this new role uh, going to be able to uh, direct, for example, health boards? I mean, just to give you a specific example, the fact that the, the contract for one of the patient, the most important patient services uh, is contracted in a way in which it can go down for 20, up to 24 hours in order to have a routine update, which is happening in Glasgow, and six other health boards have not actually gone through with this. Now, that sort of issue you know, is a matter of principle. that a, a, The health service requires 24-7, 365 day a year, its clinical IT services should be up. And it's perfectly possible, I'm assured by my IT advisors, to have contracts which actually make sure that does happen. The banks wouldn't go down for 24 hours without a major fine occurring, and yet the clinicians out there are faced with not having these services uh, recently for up to 24 hours for a routine upgrade. Now, Chair, I'm sorry, you know, it, it really staggers me that we have got a situation, uh, you know, after about 12, 15 years into the digital revolution, that we cannot get the basics of contracts right in the way that the banks have had now for some 10 years and would have been fined for. So are those principles going to be directed to the board? Can your new body actually direct the boards? To, and can they penalise them if they get these contracts wrong? So I should be clear that the health sector is, is uh, governed completely separately from the arrangements that I'm talking about. So, but having said that, because this is a, all on a sectoral basis, having said that, the principles that you were just setting out there are absolutely the principles that I would expect this board to be applying to the central government sector. And of course, the public sector IT service as a whole is one which learns lessons from each other and we would expect to be learning good practice and also learning from poor practice. So there is a wider information exchange, but the arrangements I'm talking about apply specifically to the central government sector. So, Chair, just to finish with, can you then supply us with a list of the bodies that will be overseen by this new body and won't be? You've just told us that health won't be. So, you know, presumably, Chair, we've got to get health in front of us to explain why NHS 24 has doubled its uh, costs and we still don't have it two years after it was supposed to come in. I appreciate that's for patient safety reasons, but nevertheless, the contract's gone on. So every NHS contract, we have to now think, who's going to central government going to supervise that? Another different unit. We can, of course, supply that information about the bodies. Colin Beattie, and can I go back to the issue of the skill shortages mm. and some of the challenges faced in that? <coughs> you mentioned here, and it was mentioned in the report, some of the challenges competing with the private sector. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that ever something that we're ever going to reconcile? Though? I mean, as long as the private sector are willing to pay this amount and we're in the position where we're paying much lower grade, uh, can that ever be resolved? No matter how many strategies we put in place, no matter how we take this forward, where can we go with this? Yeah. And are we actually training those individuals to then go on to the private sector? What's the, I mean, how do we deal with that? You're absolutely right that um, the public sector is almost certainly never going to be able to compete on money with the private sector. But we do think that there are things that we can compete in the private sector with. And indeed, people who've joined us recently speak very favourably about the offer that we can make. So, for example, um, people who've come to join us say often that they're motivated by the ability to see, do what they see as making a difference. So, so, so if there's all these people saying, well, yeah, I'm quite keen to join the public sector because... The, mm -hmm. I know the private sector will offer me much more money, mm -hmm. but let's go and join the public sector. I mean, it's really not happening, is it? The, there are not enough people yet who are motivated yeah. by that. So, and part of what we have to do is both through our marketing, but also through using word of mouth of the people who are working for us, communicate the message that can, there's a great job can here. Can I just ask, so with respect then, is there maybe another approach we can take mm -hmm. to this and say to the private sector, mm -hmm. why don't we just look at all of these strategies, but look at a strategy of allowing the private sector to deliver some of these projects? Mm -hmm. And that cuts out the... I mean, the, the, the private sector makes you use the middleman in this and say, well, what's the point in having all these frameworks and all these civil servants who are doing this? Why don't we just contract? And actually, that's happening already anyway. Yeah. So what's the point in, in having boards and mm -hmm. strategies and development strategies, all of the various elements of what we discussed, yeah. if the private sector are clearly picking off the cream of the crop and to ensure that they can then have these individuals who are delivering these services. Yeah. Spending a lot of money on this. Yeah. And you're right, there's a lot of, a lot of skills and um, activities for which we would, we would expect to go on using private sector resources, either because it doesn't make economic sense for us to keep those people on our books or because we don't need them very often. Um, 
I suppose I would say that whatever the private sector is doing for us, we retain the accountability for the delivery of the project and programme in, you know, in good order, so we can never completely absolve ourselves of that. And there will be always be a spectrum of involvement of the public through to the private sector. But it's getting that balance right, and there are you know, very good arguments for developing skills in-house as well, because people who understand the nature of our business and what we're trying to achieve and the inherent um, you know, public value nature of that are always going to be really useful to the scoping and delivery of, of projects. So, why don't, so it's getting a balance. So why don't we just have the overview mm -hmm. uh, and say, yeah, here's how we want to manage this, but allow the private sector to train the individuals, allow them to put uh, you know, the students through the college places and let them pay for it, instead of you know, government saying, well, we want to manage all of this. Is that, is that something that civil servants want to do on a regular basis? Just let's, let's look at a way in which we can manage this, instead of not saying to the private sector, why don't you do this? I mean, you can train it, but we'll have a strategic overview of it, because what you appear to be doing from this is you want you want both. You want to be able to manage it and the, to carry all the training. We clearly can't do that. Mm -hmm. You're not able to do it. You've yeah. proved that already. And uh, with, certainly in the current market, what you're describing, I think, would be um, prohibited from a cost point of view. And the value, the, the, the gap between the cost that we pay to bring contractors or consultants in and what we pay our own staff to grow and train them, even if ultimately then they then go and work in another part of Scotland, which, which is a double-edged sword. There's, there's value in us offering skills to, to business in Scotland as well, which we've developed. Um, at, at the moment, that's what is going to make more economic sense. Okay. It's the balance. We'll go bring Colm Beattie in. I'll bring in the Thank you, Vera. That, it was just a fact. Um, I'm a wee bit confused. Um, in my previous life, I, I did have high-level oversight over uh, IT divisions. And uh, there seems a lot of complexity in the way this has been set up. Maybe you can just clarify these relationships to me. We've got, we've got the Digital Transformation Service, which has been set up. And presumably that's overseen by the Digital Transformation Board. How exactly does that relate to Gatework Review, ICT Assurance Framework, ICT Technical Assurance, uh, Office of the Chief Information Officer, Information Systems Investment Board, it seems very complex, and complexity usually slows everything down, to be frank. How, how is this going to work efficiently? How is it going to deliver better? Yeah. I'm going to ask uh, Mike Nielsen to come in a moment to some of the detail of it. The one thing I would say is that we recognise that um, communication engagement with bodies about the respective roles of the different parts of oversight is absolutely fundamental to this. There's clear reasoning behind the different parts of the, uh, the architecture of governance and also the support roles, whether it's the Office of the Chief Information Officer or the Digital Transformation Service. But it is, of course, absolutely critical that they understand clearly what their roles are and that the people who they're supporting understand it too. That might, might want to add something on the, the, the theory behind the governance changes. Oh, okay. There are, I think, three core tasks. One is the Digital Transformation Service. The second is the oversight of the whole central government sector. And the third is the effective management of projects within Scottish government. And what we have decided to do is, rather than having the uh, ISIB covering both S Scottish government and central government, to restrict their role to what it was historically, which is just the oversight and management of Scottish Government projects and to have the Digital Transformation and Assurance Board covering the Digital Transformation Service, so support, and the overall assurance process. Below that board, we have got the assurance framework for the central government sector and that is managed by the Office of the Chief Information Officer. So it is full of acronyms. Uh, but I think it is a clear line where you've got the uh, S Chief Information Officer's Office managing the assurance framework and reporting to uh, the Digital Transformation Service and Assurance Board. I have to say, I, I, just the back of an envelope here, I've counted up eight different bodies within the government that are, that are dealing with various aspects. Yeah. And I have to tell you, if somebody if in the private sector, if somebody came to me with this sort of structure, uh, they'd soon be told where to go. It's, it cannot be efficient. It cannot be. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'll look forward with interest to see how it develops, but uh, uh, I just don't see this. Coming back to the, the constraints on, on the public sector pay scales and so forth, are we still 
largely plugging gaps with uh, short-term contracts? Part of what we're trying to do through the Digital Transformation Service is to move away from that. Um, there are still skills which we, d we don't immediately have in-house, and we are using short-term contracts for that, but we're increasingly, both through knowledge transfer and also through growing our own, trying to shift that balance so that we have got stronger, more robust in-house skills. But what sort of percentage of, uh, you know, it's probably difficult to do this, but short-term mm -hmm. contracts and agency staff filling gaps, mm -hmm. what sort of percentage is that of the whole... Mike, could you have a sense of what that is at the moment? It's, it's hard to make a, a general um, generalisation about that. I think it's fair to say that we have got a smaller proportion of permanent staff than we would wish. Um, it will tend to be between a third and two thirds, um, as it were, permanent or fixed term staff. But we would have to we'd have to give you that information. I think uh, that's quite a wide. Uh Margin. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I tell if you can follow up and provide that information mm -hmm. to the committee. I think what I'm trying to get at is uh, there is a premium for bringing in people in short term and on agency. Mm -hmm. And uh, as my colleague here knows, in the, in, the, in, the, in the health service, it's quite expensive bringing in agency nurses and so on. You pay way over the odds. Are you paying way over the odds here? Is it a question that? Uh, the public sector pay scales may be constraining, but we're actually paying more out the back door by bringing people in on these contracts and agency work. You're absolutely right in identifying the balance that we're trying to strike. Um, so wherever possible, we would try and go to the market quickly to find people who we could bring in on our own terms and conditions. And sometimes that's not successful. Sometimes it's not as successful as we would like it to be. And therefore, the balance we're trying to strike is between the uh, importance of, of providing the resources to a programme and project in a timely way, while at the same time not paying more than we have to, to do that. And over time, we're trying to shift the balance in the way I was describing, but you're absolutely correct that uh, there will still be times when we're having to plug gaps at, at greater cost. But if we, take, if we put aside the public sector pay scales mm -hmm. and simply look at the costs, mm -hmm. if you paid, for example, private sector salaries versus short -term, cost of short-term contracts and agencies, which is cheaper? The bundled cost, which is cheaper. Yeah. But, but you're right. One of the things that constrains us is that, is that there are uh, frameworks that we have to operate in in relation to what we can pay through the civil service. But put these aside. Mm -hmm. Put these aside. Which is cheaper? Um, I think the... If I, if I may come at it from the point of view of what we're trying to do is to get the best overall value for money, we do need to operate within a consistent framework um, of civil service pay. And the approach we've been taking with the Digital Transformation Service is an example of um, trying to provide the overall offer uh, to, potential, um, to, to potential employees in a way that, uh, that, brings, that is enough to bring them in. And we are having some success in that. There are some areas where, where we are having more difficulty recruiting. And we're looking at what more we can do in those areas. I think, we would, I think what we would recognise is, and I think we come back to what the convener was, was saying, that we're never going to want to have everybody in-house, partly because it's not, not value for money to have a lot of specialists. So um, there is always going to be a balance between um, permanent staff, contractors, and contracts with external companies. That's perfectly understood, but it's very simple. Is it cheaper? to pay private sector salaries or to pay for short-term contracts and agency staff? You mean to pay the equivalent of private sector yes. salaries? I'm not saying you yeah. can. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, mm -hmm. would it be? Mm -hmm. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, for some roles, I, I think where we are is we would like to be paying um, for permanent staff for a higher proportion of people because we, we need that a stronger core, but we need to look at the extent to which we'd be using a number of these for the long term. A number of people we want to have in for three months or six months or whatever. So I think it does depend upon the, the overall... It, it depends upon what, what exactly the role is. But if you looked at your budget for short-term contracts and agency staff, you know how much that's costing you. You know how much the private sector salaries are. 
leaving aside the fact that it will always be a certain proportion, as you say, you bring in for specialist contracts and so forth, that's always going to be a proportion, although it should be a relatively small proportion. Would it pay more? Would it be, would it, would it be less cost to pay private sector salary equivalent rather than agency fees and short-term contract? I, sitting here, I don't know the answer to your question, but I know that that's not an avenue that's open to us. But in looking at the, the, the uh, responses that we get to the recruitment exercises that we've done, one of the things that we are testing always is the extent to which we can push the boundaries on the existing civil service pay scales to try and take account of the market and the particular skills that are out there. But we are limited in our ability to do that. Have you made any... Pro I, mean, I would have thought you have had all these figures and you have made proposals which would have presumably save the government money. We, we do have discussions within government about um, pay, pay supplements, for example, that can be paid, and we do pay supplements to uh, existing civil service rates in order to bring people in, and that recognises that, you know, that that starts to, to address that balance between what you pay when you're paying add-ons to agencies and, what, and contractors and what you pay in-house. But again, we're doing that within a framework which is not particularly flexible. Hmm. And it's yeah, an issue I that we know... I think that maybe we could ask them to come back with more yeah. information on that. OK, we can... We can get us more information on that. Yeah, uh, we can follow up with the clerk on that. Davy Scott. Thank you, Kavina. Can I just ask about um, the external companies that were mentioned in the evidence just now? Uh, how, in the current financial year, how many contracts do uh, exist with external companies providing ICT services? To, to, to bodies right across the, the central government sector? Mm -hmm. I don't have that figure to hand, do we? No, but we can certainly follow Any up with that. Any idea of the value that. of it? as a proportion of the total spend on ICT? Not, not, not off the top of our heads here. So I'm happy to the example I've got, obviously, is this, the CAP Futures Programme, mm -hmm. where the Auditor General points out that, mm -hmm. the, that an IT delivery partner is being used for that. Is mm -hmm. that common? Yes. So more than half... I mean, I'm trying to get some understanding mm -hmm. of the numbers involved. Yes. This is the Audit Committee, mm -hmm. so we're quite good on numbers. Mm -hmm. Kind of need numbers to understand what's going on. So can you provide us at some stage with how many contracts absolutely. are being provided by an IT delivery partner? Yeah, absolutely. We can and are that. those IT delivery partners, mm -hmm. are they part of a list that are used from, are used on a regular basis? Mm -hmm. I think uh, we, we've, we've got a number of both Scottish and UK um, frameworks which are used, yeah. some of which have those lists, so we can send you that information. Yeah. Okay, and we'd get all the numbers of that and how much, and it, what the trends and how, how much it's gone up or down over, say, the last three years to kind of understand understand all that? In the context in of all of the questions of my colleagues... Over, yeah, it's, yeah, to try and understand in the context of the questions my colleagues have been asking about skills. Yeah. And if you're, in other words, if you're using more and more IT delivery partners, that rather obviates the need to worry about skills because you're hiring in more external help to deliver these contracts. So that would be my presumption. Am I right or wrong about that? I think, as, as, as Mike Nielsen was saying a moment ago, we, we, we want to have a balance between mm -hmm. bringing in, at greater cost, as we were just yeah. discussing, the skills which either we cannot source into the core government staff or which it wouldn't make economic sense for us to hold permanently. And we will always need to do that. Yeah. But what we would like to do is to reduce that as far as possible and have it sitting alongside a bank of core skills, which, in fact, we are using all the time, deploying in different places across the central government sector and building up our own knowledge and experience. And, of course, what we would hope is that the, as the Digital Transformation Service and the core staff of individual bodies become more expert, the need to be bringing in more of that external resource becomes less. Yeah, that, but it will always be a balance. Sure, I understand that. That's very fair. Um, in the current financial year, are, is the government uh, on budget or over budget in terms of spend on ICT? And again, when you say government there, you mean the whole of the, yeah. mm -hmm. the core. We wouldn't, would we hold those figures? And For Scottish government, we are on budget. Mm -hmm. We have not, we, we don't have, uh, a, a, we, we don't look at the budget from the point of view of IT spend in individual organisations aggregated, we look at it from the point of view of it, the total spend of an organisation being managed effectively. Not on ICT, just on generally? Yeah. But so who does Although for individual ICT bodies, spend? For the accountability of individual bodies, yeah. that would be an issue for them. Yeah. But so the government in that sense, the Scottish government, your core staff, don't <coughs> routinely monitor IT spend across 
um, all the NGOs and all the, so not the NGOs, the NDPBs and all the other agencies that are part of government in the round? Not, not in flight, as it were, in the year, so that to, to enable us to answer at any point in time whether across all IT spend it's on budget or not. Sure, sure. But by the end of the year, you can do that? Does, we'll, do you be do able, we'll be able to that? look across that. At but but, but uh, as a routine, I'm sorry, I'm not being very clear in my questions, mm -hmm. as a routine matter of policy and, mm -hmm. and of financial assessment mm -hmm. at the end of a financial year, are we as a government, are you as a government assessing what has happened in that financial year in terms of IT spend across the whole of the public sector that ultimately we're all responsible mm -hmm. for? We do. We collect data on the trends in public sector IT spend, which um, which we can provide. You collect data on the ITC trends. Mm -hmm. Does that mean you look at whether they're over budget or not? I mean, for example, <laughs> if Shutton Health Board spend. £10 million pounds on a new computer system mm -hmm. and it's 50% over budget, does that ping up in your system? Do you have any way of assessing what's going on across the whole? Because you're not just responsible for, after, are you, just for IT spend in the in this core Scottish government? This is the whole of the public sector we're talking about here, right? Um, no, I don't think it is. Well, it depends on what, what angle, but what the, the Auditor General report is um, talking about is the central core government. So that wouldn't, mm -hmm. for example, pick up the NHS sector. Mm -hmm. um, and my own accountability is for... I suggest Spending, them within so, core yeah. Scottish, Scottish government. Yeah. Um, so, um, so in other words, no one's looking at... I take your point, you're looking at trends, mm -hmm. but we've got no idea of how much money's being spent... On, well, we do have an idea of how mm -hmm. much money's being spent, but we don't... No one has a... looks at how much money is being spent and whether it's over or under budget as a routine matter of financial <coughs> assessment across the whole of the public sector. Not, I think, from the particular perspective that you're describing, although, of course, sponsorship teams who are responsible for a relationship with individual public bodies would, would absolutely take an interest in um, the spend of individual bodies in the same way that colleagues in the health service would take an interest in the yeah. spend of individual health bodies. Yeah, that's fine. That's OK. That's fine. Okay. Okay. Richard Simpson has a very short supplementary, it's and then I'll take him it's, it's really that the, 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 I'm concerned about all these... It really leads on from the MacArthur thing. That all these projects that there are, not the ones in core government... Uh, can we get a can we get a list of this? Does anyone compile that? Yeah. And if so, you know there are two hundred between one and five million, according mm -hmm. to the auditor. I would like to know where they are, you know what the original cost was, what the outturn was, uh, were they over budget, mm -hmm. and who scrutinised that from from government as opposed to who looks at it from the individual board. Mm -hmm. So you take the NHS twenty four. That's obviously it's been brokeraged. They've been given extra money. They've got to repay it. It's their responsibility within their overall budget to manage it. But we know it's doubled in cost. So looking at all these things would be helpful. Mm -hmm. And just one very brief comment. You might want to look at the Edinburgh Council model. That's an SNP Labour-run council mm -hmm. who were having real problems with their ICT, not dissimilar to what we're talking about today. And uh, they brought a consultant in on a contract over three or four years. And uh, in the last three months, they announced they were saving, I think it was... 35, 45 million over the next five years. Very successful. So you might want to talk to them about how they did that, you know, because there were clearly councillor oversight uh, and, and the thing has worked extremely well in making sure the contracts for that council are actually cost effective and it's going to save them a lot of money. So there's something happened there that's worth looking at. Thank you. I'll we'll certainly follow up on that. So, I mean, hopefully, if they agree to provide that information on those, all the projects. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, can you uh, tell me how widespread you actually advertise and promote the vacancies uh, that exist? Um, absolutely. Um, we, um, are, as part of what I was saying about our increasingly um, thoughtful approach to recruitment, we are um, advertising our posts in the places where we think that people are going to be looking for them. So we've been using social media a lot and uh, advertising in IT um, journals uh, and so on. And uh, that's something that we continually keep under review. From our last advertising campaign, I don't know if you want to add to Mike about the way we've done that, but it's, you know, if, if you follow Digi Scots on, on Twitter or similar things, then you see these popping up quite a lot, and we've done video case studies and so on in order to try and convey to people what's involved in working in government. So trying to get better at that all the time. Now, the reason uh, I pose the question is, uh, obviously, when the, <coughs> when the economy uh, crashed mm -hmm. uh, and there were many people were paid off uh, and laid off from the, their, their companies, and uh, obviously there were many uh, folk were paid off from their IT positions mm -hmm. uh, as a result. And obviously the economy has improved uh, somewhat since then. Mm -hmm. 
but uh, I'm quite sure that there, there will still be a number of people who, uh, who have IT qualifications. They've maybe managed to get back into employment, uh, but they're not, doing what, uh, they're not doing what they're doing beforehand, so they may well be in an underemployed uh, situation. And, and I can't get my head around why, uh, if there are vacancies uh, and opportunities uh, within the, the Scottish Government, that I can't understand why they don't see this as uh, potentially see these as uh, positive you know, opportunities. Um, I mean, there's a possibility that, uh, that the money might not be uh, might not be as good as what they're earning now, but also there's a possibility that the money might uh, and uh, the other uh, elements to uh, to a salary might actually be better yeah. than what they're getting at the moment. So I can't understand that. Yeah. You're right to point to the broader package of benefits, and again, that's something which we've been trying to explain in more detail through our most recent recruitment approaches, so giving, um, identifying both the type of work that people would be doing in government from a technical point of view, but also from the public service point of view, um, identifying the benefits of working for the Scottish <coughs> Government as an organisation, as an employer, um, and I think it's very important as well as formal advertising to recognise how um, influential our own existing staff can be as advocates for working in government. I've been really struck in the last few months meeting people who exactly the way you've described had exited private sector jobs either by choice or not by choice who've come to work in government and who say unprompted that they are getting both better technical skills than they had had access to elsewhere and also being able to be involved at scale in projects so those involved in doing things on a Scotland-wide basis that they very often wouldn't get from the private sector so we need to really understand those motivating factors and to keep building on them and learning from the people who come to work for us about why they came and, and certainly, if you know, any members of the committee or anyone else who've got um, suggestions for how we can do that better, we'd be delighted to hear that. Uh, I mean, I would suggest it's probably not just a matter of uh, understanding it better, but it's mm -hmm. about actually promoting it better uh, mm -hmm. to, to tell the wider world yeah. about the opportunities that are there. Yeah. Uh, and, I mean, mm -hmm. hundreds yeah, understanding of people will, purpose, hundreds of people will graduate every single year mm -hmm. uh, from uh, universities in Scotland and, and uh, elsewhere in the UK, and, uh, and also there, there will be many people uh, who might actually want to come to Scotland uh, to work uh, yeah. and see you know, the opportunities uh, and, and get involved in these opportunities. Yeah. So I, I think there, there certainly is a role to, to have a, a better promotion uh, of what's actually going on. And one of the things we've been developing within government has been our own modern apprentice IT, ICT stream. And uh, in order to ensure that we are attracting people into that, we've been working with the modern apprenticeship uh, promotion programmes, and that's proving very successful. So I agree all opportunities like that to identify our target interest groups and to persuade them to come and work for us. Uh, so it's, uh, in terms of uh, one final question, can just in terms of um, any further uh, information that you do provide to the committee, mm -hmm. uh, can you provide us with um, after today's discussion? Mm -hmm. And uh, I assume yourself and your colleagues will uh, will certainly be having a, having a review of uh, what's been discussed here today. Mm -hmm. uh, can you provide uh, the committee with uh, some uh, further action points that uh, that you will be looking at, um, so so that we can uh, understand a bit more in terms of. Uh, what you do intend uh, doing to have a, a wider promotion of the vacancies. Very happy to do that. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, and, <coughs> and good morning. Uh, you spoke very uh, early on a, a lot about assurance, and Colin Beattie has looked at the structure, and I have to say that I, I tend to share his concern about that management tree. But if I could just think of it in the context of individual projects, uh, assurance means a lot of things, but at the very least it must mean you're knowing who's responsible for a project, uh, whether that project's properly defined, whether that's being properly managed, and whether the money is being paid to the right people at the right time for the right work. Now, if I go back up my list, who's responsible for a project will, in your terms, be the accountable officer. I suspect that causes no problem. At the very bottom of my list, whether the money goes to the right place is essentially auditing, and I'm not worried about that at the moment. In the context of ICT projects, though, I suspect knowing whether the project is properly defined is one of the things that you spoke about in the context of scoping. Whether the project is properly being properly managed is, is the thing I'd really like to pursue. Can I say from a background in engineering, one of the issues that we learned a long time ago but occasionally forget is that if you want to build a building, it's very straightforward as long as you put together a decent set of drawings and then never change them. And we're sitting in a building where people forgot that. Now, it seems to me that most of what I'm seeing in uh, ICT projects overrunning is probably because people change it as they go along. Now, my first question, therefore, is, is that perception correct, please? Over the 
run of projects which we've been doing within government for a while, many of them have overrun, many of them have been late, is it generally speaking because people have changed the scope of the project and inevitably that changes the cost mm -hmm. or other other factors? Yeah. I don't think I'd feel confident to, to generalise in response to that, but I, and I know you're going to be speaking to my colleagues later who've been involved in the IT Futures project, and yeah. clearly the changes you know, with their control that were made to that were a very significant factor in, in the experience yeah. of, of that project. I suppose the other thing which I would say is that um, increasingly, as, as, as the report notes, um, agile project management techniques are being applied to projects, mm -hmm. and agile is an approach which is designed to be iterative and therefore to enable a project to be taken forward while the requirements are still being identified, but to do so in a way which is managed and, and controlled. And one of the things which we have identified, and indeed the Auditor General has identified in both reports, is the need to ensure that people who are adopting an agile form of project management really understand how that works and have the skills necessary to do that properly and in a controlled manner, so that whether you're doing something in a traditional Prince 2 methodology or with an agile methodology, the correct cost and time controls are being applied to it. Okay, then can I pick up on Agile, and I'm guessing what you mean in there, but it, uh, I, I can see the concept. No. Is it possible to cost those honestly? If you really don't know where you're going to finish, but you know what you're trying to do in the development of anything, is it actually possible to cost it from the beginning in any reasonable way? We would be expecting that particularly within the digital transformation service, but also within my own wider team, we are building up through our knowledge of projects working through Agile, the expertise to make as good an estimate as needs to be made at the outset of cost of those projects, because it, it, it is never going to be sensible or, or appropriate for the public sector to embark on projects where it has no idea what the cost envelope is. We have to mm -hmm. be able to make sensible predictions of cost so that we can plan for projects and have them signed off properly. Um, but it's a different process, clearly, from the traditional one. Yeah, OK, in which case you've just, forgive me, convener, but you've just used a word which, uh, envelope, which we never hear. Sorry, I entirely understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Costs are somewhere between here and there, and I honestly don't know where. Mm -hmm. I hope it's on the low end, of course. Mm -hmm. Do we ever say that in public? Mm -hmm. I don't think we do. Mm -hmm. We come up with a number, which may be the mean or the median or... or sorry, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, would it, if, if that's the case, and I understand it, and that may be the reality uh, pretty much in every project, wouldn't mm -hmm. it be wiser if we actually made sure the numbers we quoted mm -hmm. had a spread? Um, rather than quoting a single figure, because it might save us all a lot of grief. Yeah. I'm, I'm certainly all in favour of um, you know, transparency and, and realism about the nature of projects. Thank you. Can I just finally just maybe make an observation and a question at the same time? So, I mean, obviously, three of you come with quite significant experience in civil service. I know, Sarah, you were actually here at one point because you were a clerk in the audit committee and when I was in the first audit committee in 1999. So, the three of you come with significant civil service experience and are respected within that area. But does it raise the issue about you know, would Google or Apple or Microsoft employ civil servants? And I say that with respect uh, and for the role that you're looking to carry out. So is that one of the challenges that we face here? Should we be employing? And I, and I say it with, I just ask you to depart yourself from the current roles that you play uh, in your own uh, area. Is that not what we should be looking at? Is that how ambitious, if the government really want to run an ambitious mm -hmm. ICT project, mm -hmm. do they not just have to pay for the Apple and the Microsoft people of the world to? That's all they've ever done yeah. from the, the age of 16. Yeah. And I say it with respect. You know, abs absolutely. Um, I think for, for running any government project or programme, particularly the really big value ones of huge importance to the reputation of the organisation, but also the quality of service delivery to the public, which is of course what this is all about, we would hope to have the very best people that we could find to run these projects. And sometimes that will be people who are in-house because they have skills, um, as indeed Maxine has in, in her career in, in, in IT development, um, but who've chosen to make their career in government for all sorts of different reasons. And sometimes it will be sourcing the very best people from you know, the Googles and the Apples and other places who either want to come to government for a while for personal reasons, who want to do this, this type of work, or because you know, to get their skills, we have to pay them what the market demands. Um, so certainly, you know, we are ambitious and aspirational in this context, and we want to be you know, a world-class digital nation, and that means having world-class skills. I think what we've identified today is that we're constantly managing the tension between our financial accountabilities and our delivery accountabilities to try and get that balance 
Mm. Right. And, and recognising that there are times when what you need is a technical specialist, and when what you need is a technical specialist, that's what you have but, to apply. But, but you recognise, though, that mm -hmm. you know, if this is a commercial enterprise that has mm -hmm. been run, like Google or whatever, mm -hmm. then the people who are at the very top who are managing that would, would be oh, IT. I mean, mm -hmm. mean, there would be people who are IT specialists. Mm -hmm. There would be I mean, Microsoft, mm -hmm. uh, you know, all of these companies. And, um, and given the money that's mm -hmm. been spent here, it's a significant investment the government are making. So it's, I mean, I'm not saying we're in the same league as Apple yeah. and everything else, but we're, you know, it's significant sums of money have been spent here. Yeah. So it's not, it's not, it's not something that could mm -hmm. attract people from a significant, or significant players mm -hmm. in the IT market. Mm -hmm. It would be interesting to know how much time the most senior managers of Google and, and Microsoft and other organisations are spending actually on IT solutions. I suspect that the leadership role and the governance role is the one which <coughs> predominantly preoccupies them. And certainly in the same way, you know, I, I am not personally um, dealing with IT solutions. Um, I think that there's clearly a leadership and management role in relation to all of this, but I take very seriously my responsibility for making sure that those who are in technical, skill, uh, technical positions have the skills that they need. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you to three witnesses. And can I suspend the committee for five minutes? Okay, uh, thank you colleagues. We now move on to agenda, agenda item number two, uh, which is oral evidence on the EGS report entitled the 2013 uh, report. Sorry. Oh, sorry, just to clarify, it's agenda item number three, uh, and it's in respect of the Scottish Government's consolidated accounts, the Common Agricultural Policy uh, Futures Programme. Uh, just to clarify, the committee has received written submissions from the Scottish Government uh, and the European Commission in connection uh, with which, which what's been contained in the papers for, for this meeting. 
Uh, can I welcome our panel of witnesses this morning? Uh, Graham Dixon, who is the Director General of Enterprise, Environment and Innovation. Uh, Jonathan Price, uh, the Director of Agriculture, Food uh, and Rural Communities. And David Barnes, the Chief Agriculture Officer of the Scottish Government. I understand that Mr Dixon has a short opening statement. Thank you, Convener. I'll be brief. Um, I'm very grateful for your invitation to give evidence today because of the complexity of this programme and the way it is moving very quickly. I think it's helpful to give you an oral update and progress uh, rather than a written one. I'm also conscious that it's quite a different membership of the committee from when we gave oral evidence uh, last November, so I hope that will help us. Um, we will try to be concise, but because there is a lot of European jargon in this, uh, we will try to explain it and, and it may take a bit of time. Um, can I just remind the committee that the new common agricultural policy we're implementing is radically different to the, to the existing policy. Um, the EU promised to simplify it, but this will in fact be the most complex ever. And as well as introducing a new to IT system, this will involve us in a new way of calculating subsidies, a range of new schemes uh, and complex new rules on greening. Uh, it's new for our farm businesses who are applying under the schemes uh, and all of our staff who implement it. And we've had to make all of these changes against a very tight and fixed timetable. Um, hearing the evidence prior to this, I can assure you that uh, our Information Systems Investment Board considered the programme at an early stage. It's been subject to gateway reviews and it has its own simple and I believe good governance structure now running it. And it's also given the scale been fully within the sight of our ministerial team and senior management since its early stages. Since we last gave evidence, we've made good progress. We've met our deadlines, and as I reported in June, we received almost 21,000 applications for the single payment on time. Uh, we've had excellent support from NFUS and our farmers and agents who have been patient with some of the early teething problems we had in the application window. We've got a clear plan in place for the remainder of the programme, and it's being followed. Uh, we also have an excellent and highly experienced team in place, both in our IT side uh, and in our business, which David runs. Uh, we also have a very good contractor in place uh, who we're working with uh, very uh, collaboratively. Um, this programme is an absolute priority for me as accountable officer, and it will remain so until it's completed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now to open to questions, and Tavish Scott. Uh, I wonder if I could start on the Futures Programme, Mr Dixon, by just asking if the, if the new programme, and I take all your points about the complexity, will deliver farm payments in the first two weeks of December, as, as we all hope. Uh, as I mentioned, convenient, we have a very detailed plan to start payments as planned from December. It's a very, very tight uh, schedule, and it depends on everything being delivered one thing after another bearing in mind that we kept applications open a month longer and it's the first time we're doing it. Um, we've got a lot of complex business processes to do in the coming three months. We've got to calculate both new payments and the old system which tapers out. But as I said, we've got a dedicated and highly motivated uh, team of staff who are doing their utmost to deliver this. I mean, I was one of the people calling for it to be extended yes. by one month on behalf yep. of all the farmers I represent, so I, I, I totally take that point. Um, could you deal with the costs? Uh, because obviously the Auditor General reported to the committee that the original business case for the Futures Programme was £102.5 million, and that had increased to, uh, let me get the right figure here, £178 million as of March 2015. Now, those obviously the Auditor General's figures, I guess, based on the audit of, of your programme. What, what's the latest figure? Uh, the latest figure we're working to is the business case of £178 million, And that, um, again, referring back to questions in the previous evidence session, contains um, an element of optimism bias. Mm -hmm. So that, that is the, the outside of the envelope. There is contingency or, or optimism built into that. So your expectation is that the system will be delivered for the within that £178 million pound Budget. I very much hope so. Yeah, and just t tell the committee when that, um, as it were, date closes. When is it judged that the system? Is it when all those ch uh, automated bank payments go to farmers? Right, got 22,000 farmers across Scotland, or it obviously rolls on from year to year because these payments clearly happen on an annual basis. 
Maybe. If I, the, the business case is, is uh, um, over a five-year period. Right. So it's, been, it's essentially in um, the end of March 2017 that the five-year business case comes to an end. Obviously, the, 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 the thing that we're focused on at the moment is getting the farm payments out uh, starting in December. And, um, but there is more functionality that will be required, um, both in relation to some of the Pillar 2 schemes and um, the livestock schemes that are also required for this year. Um, and we also have further, further mandatory requirements from Europe around a new land parcel information sy system. Mm -hmm. and the scheme account and management mm -hmm. scheme. So that, that is all there. There are then um, things that would be around business, business, business efficiency that we would, in, we would hope to um, implement in that period up to um, March 2017. Uh, but obviously we will come to that in, in yeah. once, we've, once we've covered all the mandatory elements. Okay, that's helpful to understand the date. Um, the, other, the other side to the cost, within the cost, the, within the 178 million, was the figure that the that Audit Scotland put on the IT delivery partner, which was ad, again at March 2015, 60.4 million, which had gone up from 28.8 million. A, who is the IT? If you'll forgive me, who is the IT delivery uh, partner? And B, what has obviously changed between 28.8 and 60.4? Uh, the IT delivery partner and the principal one is CGI. Um, they're the company that Mr. Sim Dr. Simpson referred to earlier who've just won the contract for the City of Edinburgh. Uh, and I have to confess they're also the Parliament's IT supplier. You did really well till you mentioned that. <laughs> um, the, I, I think maybe, maybe if, I, if you could bear with me just to take you back to the Auditor General's original sure. report. Yep. Um, at the time the initial business case was done, uh, you know, we did not know what we were going to deliver uh, or to, to scope it. Mm -hmm. uh, and as she says in the report, you know, it, it's practically impossible to let a contract that is a fixed price in the outset in those circumstances, uh, you know, cost increases, the work develops, and the scope becomes clearer. And as I said when I gave evidence last November, you know, our initial stage, we got it wrong. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we took advice from procurement, from other people who looked at similar systems, but at that point, uh, you know, a couple of years away from knowing what the new scheme would be, mm -hmm. you know, we underestimated radically what it would cost for the IT part mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. Our next business case, which we brought in, I think in March last year, yeah. we had a clearer idea. And since then, we have met a number of different cost pressures, additional elements that we need to build, like the, the land, parcel the land parcel information system, which is a, an enormous database of 500,000 yeah. fields, mm -hmm. effectively, we've had to bring in as well. So mm -hmm. that's what's taken it up to the current figure. And in your assessment, therefore, of, the, of that IT delivery partner, they've, they haven't overloaded the costs, they can justify to you and therefore to, uh, to an audit committee of parliament that uh, those costs are just, well, justifiable? Yes, we are, as I said, paying them on uh, the basis of the, the work they deliver. We agree work orders with them uh, and we, you know, we challenge anything about you know, gold plating. Mm. There, there have been a number of factors that have impacted on us. As I said, complexity is a big one. Yeah. Um, and change market conditions have also come into it. So we have uh, rates in the contract that we will pay them, and I think we are now paying for, for things like developers about 32% above the original envisaged contract rate with them. Uh, and the third thing we've needed to do is to um, effectively put a, a kind of surge capacity in at various points to meet first the opening of the new portal in January, uh, and then to meet the opening of the payment window, which had to be the 15th of March. Mm -hmm. you know, we paid a lot of overtime, we brought in additional staff, uh, and we will do the same in the run-up to making payments. That's fair. Um, Jonathan Price mentioned 2017 as the period of the, of the programme overall. Your letter to the committee of the 22nd of June said that I'm going to get the figures wrong here, but 35% of submissions for the, uh, for, of the single application form to the government were made on paper as opposed to online. Uh, I can't say I'm remotely, I'm sure you're not remotely surprised by that as well, given I, I've seen this stuff and the complexity of it is scary for um, for anyone. Um, so that's not quite the way I'm sure the NFU would describe it, but um, 
but uh, do you envisage or does your business case envisage that 35% number dropping and dropping significantly? And if it does, just remind me if we're in lots of areas such as mine where there isn't broadband, how crofters are meant to actually do it online in the first place. I will let um, Jonathan give you a briefing and, and some of or David on some of the arrangements mm. we've put in place for remote areas. However, the, I mean, the approach that, that we took was that we would have digital by encouraging people to do it. Yeah. And the new system, it, it, it's a complex new system for anybody to fill in, yeah. but it has a number of advantages for uh, farmers and agents in that they what they see is now pre-populated and it does checks as it goes mm -hmm. through it to say, you know, by the time you come to submit the form, mm -hmm. this is compliant. But to have the checks, you need to have super fast broadband because otherwise the system's so yes. slow it grinds to a stop and that was yep. your problem right at the outset. So, so they so chicken the, and egg on that the, one. The, the question is, you're building oh. in the incentive so people yeah. will do it online. That. Yeah. Down south, they took a digital by default. Indeed. We did not and we do not. that. We see the problems But we've, we've yeah. put measures in place to help farmers in remote mm. areas. And if you want to hear from Jonathan, David, well, I, I, I kind of know about that. Yeah. It's just that what I'm really after is the future policy going forward and, and, and whether it is reasonable to expect the number of applications uh, to, to rise that are online as opposed to in paper when uh, I know they can go into the local department office yeah. and all those things but that's not really the perfect scenario is it? If I, if I can answer the, the question in, in particularly f first of all your, your question about the business case um, what does it assume? The business case benefits are not dependent upon a significant shift um, in, uh, shift significant increase right. okay. in that. So, in terms of the financial elements of that, that's not that's not that's not a huge part of it. Okay. Um, the we we achieved almost exactly the same percentage this year, a small increase in the yeah. percentage of of online applications this year, and that was, of course, in the face of some of the difficulties that some of the teething issues that we had with the with the online system um, during the application window. Um, and we've got some very detailed data um, that, we, that, that show us those, for, for example, agents. Um, agents normally, apply, normally use the online system yeah. almost exclusively yeah. and very few um, paper applications. We've got a significant chunk of agents that use paper yeah. um, this year and we're, we're pretty confident that we'll get them back onto online next yeah. year. And of course that doesn't answer your point about the, about the availability of broadband, but in general well, the agents will make yeah. sure they're covered. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. And the final question, if I may, convener, was just on the. Just I wanted to, on your thoughts on this. The paper that we got from the European Commission, which was, even by the standards of the European Commission, um, <laughs> incomprehensible, um, uh, said on the financial section section, which is obviously really important to you yes. and also yes. very important to individual crafters and farmers. It said um, additional complexity is added by member states' own supplementary rules and conditions, which are added in order to tailor and target aid, notably in fairness in, in rural development programmes. So I appreciate that's what they're trying to suggest there. Do you think that's fair? Um, and is it the case the Scottish Government have added additional complexity, as the European Commission would appear to be suggesting, given they were writing this letter to us, as opposed to the Audit Committee of some yes. other part of Europe? Uh, yes, I mean, w the industry asked us for more complexity. They asked us to have three different payment regions mm -hmm. so where we pay a, a fixed price per hectare, different parts of the country, which makes it, and three livestock schemes. So we have, I think, a sheep scheme, a beef scheme, and an island beef scheme, which, you know, again, are things which make it more difficult, but they are targeted towards helping Scottish farmers. And I think that's the, the difficult balance, is you could have a one-size-fits-all policy, but it, yeah. you know, what fits in France would not fit in Scotland. Yeah. So the Commission actually have a point on this one? We have tried to make things as yeah. simple as possible, yeah. Yeah. but within the, uh, within the constraints of trying to target the four or five hundred million pounds best to our farming community. Okay, thank you. Brief supplementary from Nigel Don. Yeah, thank you, Convener. It's, it's, it's absolutely on this point. I'm just wondering if I can pick up, and I'm hoping you're going to, simply going to say yes. Once the scheme is set up, presumably the pre-population then comes back next year. The scheme doesn't change, so unless a farmer makes a material change on their farm, they don't have to do anything other than press return next year. Is that essentially where we're going? M more or less. Um, <laughs> I, I would hope yeah. so, provided the Commission does not change the rules. 
Uh, and, and, we, and we know from experience that, that there are always some rule changes every year from the Commission. Um, we are, with Commissioner Hogan in place, he's, his focus is very much on simplification. Yeah. So that is intended to mean that we shouldn't have significant changes. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes even simplification is a change, mm -hmm. even to make it simpler. So, so we may see some of, some of that. There are some things that we have to do. Um, so we have to make sure that we are clear that we have a geospatial application um, in place um, for all farmers by 2018. Mm -hmm. So that's, a, that's an additional requirement. Um, but again, that should be, that's intended to make it easy, as, it, as easy as possible for farmers rather than make it harder for farmers. But it, it certainly increases the complexity for us. Um, I'm looking at the, uh, the Audit Scotland report on page 7. Paragraphs 14, 15, and 16. This uh, 178 million, according to what I can see, isn't going to deliver the whole project. There is, there's items that have been uh, taken out in order to enable the, the core or most urgent piece to be put in place. Um, is there a plan for the rest of it to be implemented at some point? And if so, do we have any guesstimate as to costs? Um, the the, are you referring to the Section 22 report from um, 2014, autumn 2014? That That's the, correct. Yes. Okay. The, I mean, the, 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 there were there were some there were some things that we essentially deferred rather than took out altogether, um, and the, the, the specific things they they mention I think are SMS text messages yeah. um, for alerting farmers to you know a, a change in. A change or something that they, they might need to do. I think the big thing here was the yeah. mapping of registered land that was referred to. The, um, oh, sorry, do, do you mean the farmers able That's to submit the their own? Yeah. Oh, sorry, the farmers able to submit their own application, uh, their, so it's to submit updates to their, to their land online. Yes, and that's, that is something that that is um, in scope. It is in scope within the current business case. Uh, it's not yet delivered, but it will be part of the new land parcel information system. So which part of the, the items that were deferred are not covered by the 178 million? Um, more, more or less, um, there's nothing that we've, we've ruled out of scope. We have deferred things because obviously we've been working hard to meet the, the statutory and regulatory deadlines uh, to ensure that we get the, the main bulk of the payments out um, as, as, as early as we can. Um, but we've not ruled, we've not ruled anything out as a result of um, reordering um, the the order the order in, in which yeah. we brought functionality in. When you say you haven't ruled it out, does that mean it's actually within the 178 million budget? Um, the, the 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 178 million budget um, was drawn up in order to enable that kind of scope to be included. Um, what I what I will what I co couldn't give you a guarantee today is that the 178 million will will pay for all of that functionality, which again is what I was saying that um, you know we know what we absolutely have to do, and then there are things that that will will in, improve our business efficiency in terms of the the operations of the of of the paying agency and and the agricultural staff. Um, whether we can get all of that delivered within the 178 million is is unclear at this point in time, because as I say, we're working to to get the the, the most important elements in, um, and we will have a, a, a we will likely have a future decision to take as to exactly uh, what is most cost effective and what is good use of public money in terms of making further improvements. Um, and, and 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 as I said, the the business case runs to um, March 2017. Um, but there will be continuing investment in the systems beyond that date as well. So some things may be deferred, um, def deferred beyond the existing five-year yeah. program. But the, the biggest part of it, the online mapping, the, is the part of is sorry. currently part of a procurement for a new land parcel in sorry, I can't say, information. land parcel information system. The other two elements which which came up in our evidence last time around SMS messaging, mm -hmm. which is a nice to have and also the ability for our in field inspectors to do um, livestock inspections on their, their laptops. And again, that was about, you know, w we will look at that, see whether the business benefits from it uh, meet the costs. When, when will you know 
if there's any additional cost to this. When would you anticipate having that information? I, 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 what I would say at the moment is that we are working to that £178 million pound business case um, and we are, not in, we are not intending to exceed that um, and it, it may be that certain elements um, we choose not to deliver if they don't provide a sufficient individual um, cost, cost benefit um, uh, ratio in, in, in but there is a possibility of a, a further business case being brought forward to bring other elements into this so the 178 million is not necessarily the end of the road I, I think I think what, what I'm saying is that we we will take a we will take a cost benefit view of all of the things that we intend to deliver within the 178 million if it turns out that 178 million will not be enough to do all of that and as I say, these are these are things that are, um, you know, we we have within the business case things are not that are not absolutely essential to meet the European re regulatory requirements and our compliance uh, duties, um, but things that we that that we thought would be good to have in order to improve our efficiency. Um, and as I say, we have been so focused on dealing with the regulatory compliance. Um, regulatory requirements um, that we are not yet at the stage of doing a further analysis as to would we want to spend an extra three million for example on a particular um, piece of um, business efficiency uh, and what do we think the cost benefit of that will be so so we will come to that in time um, and 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 as is you know and 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 we're we're yeah, I mean, we, we, we've, we're, we're, I'm pretty confident that we can do everything we have to do uh, within the current business case price. You're talking about cost benefit. Uh, again, looking at the report here, paragraph five and page four, the Scottish government estimates that it would incur costs of 50 million a year if the IT system mm -hmm. failed to deliver. 178 million, so you got three and a half year payback, crudely. Mm -hmm. Is that, is that a good investment? Um, I'm not suggesting we don't take the European money, but uh, <laughs> it does seem disproportionate, doesn't it? I mean, the fact of the matter is we have no choice. Um, we, we have mm. to have a compliant system. Um, and we have to have a compliant system even if we still suffer disallowance. But obviously our intention is to ensure that we don't suffer, suffer disallowance. Mm. Okay, give me this going. Um, can, I, can I just say it's uh, actually quite refreshing when someone comes in front of this committee and honestly says that, I think you said in the initial stage, you got it wrong. And uh, I, I thank you for that. Quite refreshing and I have to say quite unique um, instead of the jargonistic speeches that we, we often get. Can I first ask for a supplementary into the response you gave to Tavish Scott? You said that you will start the payments to farmers in December. It's the word start that I was concerned about. Will all farmers be paid in December this year? Um, we have got a pretty good record of getting, I think last year it was about 90, just over 90% of payments out in the first couple of days in December. We, th there are various complex rules and we cannot pay or begin to pay farmers until um, inspections are through, so that the people who are not being paid don't know that they're going to be inspected and then do things to um, to get out of it. So we have we're we're never in a position of getting a hundred percent out, um, but we you know we endeavour to get those who are inspected and and all the other payments out as soon as possible after that. Well, unlike Tavish, I'm not a farmer, so I'm not sure about uh, these, these inspections. What percentage of farmers can look forward to receiving payments in December? And mm. if not in December, for whatever reason, what is likely to be the extent of the delay? A month, two months, three months, whatever? Uh, at present, we are, I mean, our plan is to get as many out as we can in December and to, and to a high percentage of it um, 
the Cabinet Secretary has already announced that we're likely to split payments, as we've done in the first year of previous schemes, and that's something generally that's happening across Europe. So our, our aim, and, and we won't know you until... You mean they'll get their payments in inst instalments, is that yes, what you mean? Yes, and so we will try to get the highest possible instalment to the highest number of people in December, and then as quickly as possible thereafter, I, early I, I'm in the not year. I'm familiar and, with rural issues, yes. so what's the highest number, the highest payment to the highest number, is that, I, I mean, can, given that we're the audit committee, yes. can you give us an idea of... Because I, I did meet Alan Bowie of the National Farmers Union at the weekend, and he did say that farmers are worried, and I think they are looking to this Parliament to, you know, to find out when the payments that they so yes. depend on will come in. So can you be a bit more precise than the I, highest? I, I'm afraid I can't give you a, a precise okay. figure today because that's something that David and his team will work through as we get closer and closer to it, and we know how many people whose forms we've processed, how many we can be safe to pay. And it's, it's, it's not a... In order to reclaim the money from Europe, we can't just make payments. We have to do it in a way that complies with all the rules yeah. and ticks all the boxes. I do appreciate that, so, but, you know, given I, that we represent yes, constituents and, and they're looking to us for uncertainty and what they've had for the past year is a huge amount of risk and a huge amount of uncertainty, and I'm trying to do my best to bring I, forward an assurance, but I, I don't think I'm getting I, it. I, I appreciate that, and, yeah. and we, and I don't know if you want to say more, David, when we will get there. Yes, well, all, all I wanted to add was that, as, uh, as Graham has said, there are European rules that we have to abide by to make sure that we're not risking overpaying people. The reason we're not in a position to, to give numbers at this stage is because every farmer's individual payment is different. When we get to the end of this policy, after the, the transition period that we'll go through to 2019, all farmers will be getting, at that point, all farmers will get the same amount of money per hectare, and the, the arithmetic will be relatively straightforward. However, in 2015, what every farmer will get is a combination of some money on a flat rate basis like that, but quite a lot of money based on what that farmer's individual track record is. Now, what that means is, if having processed X percent of claims um, doesn't give us a fixed amount of assurance about how we're running up against the budget, because, uh, because each individual farmer's uh, payment is different, so having, having, tr having treated a 100 hectare farm from one farm doesn't give us the same amount of budget certainty as a 100 hectare claim from another farm, uh, unfortunately. Well, just on that point, convenient, if I can ask my final question. Can I put it this way? Will all farmers get a payment in December, whether that's the first instalment or the full payment? Will all farmers get something? As well, as I said, we will we will try to get as mu much money to as many people as we can, and you know, both um, the cabinet secretary and the deputy first minister you know, w are meeting us regularly to talk about progress. And as soon as we get to a point where we've got some certainty and we know what we can do with a reasonable amount of risk, then you know, w we are keeping the farming uh, industry as up-to-date as we can right, in progress. Well, I, I think I've gone as far as I can yeah. on that one. So I've got one additional question, convener, and uh, you did mention again to Tavish and to my colleague uh, Colin Beattie about the complexity of the, um, uh, the programme and about the changes made. And uh, I appreciate that you have three different schemes here, but in 29 countries in Europe and four countries in the United Kingdom, the complexity would be fairly similar. Yes. Um, did all of the... Uh, well, uh, uh, a question in two parts. Why were 50 changes made uh, to the official guidance between the opening of the application window and its close? Uh, so 50 changes were made in Scotland. And my second part is uh, the other countries in the United Kingdom, did they also have a 74% increase in their budget yours is 102 to 178 so did the other countries in the UK have the same number of changes and the same hike in the budget I'll ask David if he can okay. address the changes in, in the scheme guidance um, okay. 
we don't have and we haven't seen any you know, official reporting of other schemes within the UK. Um, it's in the public domain that they... I think if they've gone up by 74%, we might have known about it. Well, I, I think that, again, as I said at the beginning, when people started in this, nobody knew what it was they were delivering. The Rural Payments Agency, I think, have spent about £154 million on their IT system. Um, that, is that in England? That's in England. So they're 154 and you're 178? I think their, theirs is just, we believe, on the IT component alone. So there are... You know, and they took a completely different approach from, from we did. I think the Welsh had have done more of an incremental approach across a number of years, and I'm not sure where they've got to in Northern Ireland. But I think across Europe, um, and Jonathan meets you know, the European paying agencies, this has been a challenge in every country, in every member state, delivering something new and so complex. And, and have they all gone up by an average of 74%? That we don't have the figures from no. from other countries, okay. and you know we don't know where they started. And as I said, in our case, we were over optimistic. And so in, the cost of the year. English system, given that we've got ten times the population nearly, is similar to the cost of the Scottish system. Um, is that correct? We may have ten times the population, but the system has to cover a scheme, however many people apply for it, and and they have four times the number of. Um, claimants that we do. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the, the 50 changes between sorry, the David. opening of the application window and close. Yes, it's, it's very important to emphasise that um, that doesn't mean that there were 50 changes to the rules that farmers had to comply with in, in, in flight, as it were. Um, we changed the way in which the guidance was presented to farmers in but January there were 50 this changes. year. There were a number of changes to, to, to clarify the, the, the position. We, um, in response to feedback from customers on the previous version of our guidance, the feedback we got was that the guidance was too disparate, guidance on different... Uh, schemes was in different places, it was in different formats. So we put a lot of effort into, from January this year, on the new portal, putting all the guidance in one place, putting it in a consistent format and so on. Now, of course, we got feedback all the time on that, a lot of it very positive feedback, but nonetheless there were uh, spelling mistakes, there were things that weren't in the right place, there were things that were expressed in a way which the writer thought was clear, but the audience out there said to us, actually, that's, that's not clear. It needs clarifying. So, yes, I would, uh, uh, you, sh you should see this as a, as a sense of continual uh, improvement of the guidance, which, which we're still going through now. I'll just leave it there. Sure. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, earlier on in your comments, Mr Dixon, um, I think you mentioned uh, also the complexity uh, of this new uh, scheme. I think you mentioned, uh, in terms of IT, some of the 5,000... Fields, yes, from memory. Uh, five hundred thousand, five hundred thousand, half a million, five hundred thousand. Yes, right, okay. Um, uh, it's in terms of in two thousand and twelve, uh, this Parliament passed the the Land Registration Act, uh, and in terms of the the complexity of land registration in Scotland. That that actually ha has the the actual land registration system that we have also currently working with uh, too, um, has that actually had a, an implication or an effect upon uh, what you're trying to implement? Uh, no, it, I'm afraid it has to be a completely different system. What we have to maintain for the European Commission is a record of every field piece of land that um, our farmers and agents claim for or, or have responsibility for, and that may be separate from the cadastral map that Registers of Scotland will hold that shows you know, the holding of, of a farmer or, or a business. So I'm afraid that has not helped to simplify it. And the complication on top of it is, as well as recording every single field boundary down to the, you know, a very precise uh, limit, we're required from, I think you said, 2018 to bring in a number of different layers that sit on top of that, showing biological features that, that farmers will need to maintain as well. So it, it, it's horrendously complex. So with, uh, 
with the rollout of the, the new land registration process, yep. will that make things easier for you in the future? Uh, bearing in mind, obviously, uh, there may be other yep. amendments from the Commission on an annual basis. Uh, I mean, the, the land registration is, is predominantly about title mm -hmm. to the land. Um, and the, the system that we hold is all about the, um, what, is, what is actually on the land, what features are there, um, the, eligib the, the, the eligibility of the, of, of, of the area within that field, how much of it can be claimed against. Um, if it can't be foraged by livestock, then it, you, can't claim, you can't claim for that. Um, so we have to do very detailed mapping of individual features, sometimes down to individual trees, um, certainly down to down to hedges, boundaries, um, and you know water, small, relatively small water features, uh, which again um, will un will under most circumstances not be eligible. So it it really is a very different um, system to that that's used <coughs> by registers of Scotland. Okay. Okay. No. Thanks very much, Richard Simpson. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very interesting, this particular area is the one I'm interested in because it's about land use and land mapping, the precise use of the land and not just that's a field and it's so big, what are the trees, what are the water features, etc. Um, what uh, wildlife protection is being put in place. So it's all about outcomes and use, which is fascinating. But I'm really interested in the disallowance side and the inspection. Um, you know, w does the system now... Have you got the necessary system in place to do the inspections, to do the verification visits and checks before the payments can be made? Because it seems the timescale on that is pretty tight. Uh, the, the first uh, set of inspections we had to do were under the new greening requirement, uh, and they had to be done clearly while there was still evidence in the ground for inspectors to see. So I think David's inspectors were out until 15th of July, inspecting, you, know, you, you probably don't want to know the detail of what they were inspecting, but that worked. Uh, and then the next set of inspections around the other parts of eligibility um, are, are coming up. So, so we, we have the inspection software deployed now and being used by them. So that, I mean, Colin was asking about that earlier on. So that's in place that the inspectors can go out with the information uh, on their laptop or PC or, what, or, or tablet or whatever, and they can check it against what they're seeing on the ground quite easily, can they? Yes. Yes. The uh, what they have is a is a downloadable system, so they go out with GPS. Yes. Kit. Yeah. Uh, they 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 download in the office uh, the relevant set of data for the yes. for the farm that they're inspecting. They go out and do the work. They're not in real time. Uh, connection with the with, with the system that may no, be one of the future things, um, but when they when they're back in the office, uh, they do they do an upload. So so yes, that's in place and that's that's happening. So it's not it, it's not going to cause any delay in these payments or the interim. You're going to be able to complete those, are you? We have a plan to ensure that it doesn't cause any delay in payments. That plan includes, if necessary, going to a farm doing the initial stages of the inspection, taking it to a certain point of completion, right. but then if necessary, going away in order to do the same on other farms and coming back to finish the first inspection at a later date. Clearly that's not the most efficient way to operate. It's not the way that we normally do it. So if it's possible for us to avoid that inefficiency, we will do it. But if necessary, we will uh, do it the first way I explained in order to make sure that inspections aren't an obstacle to payments being made. So you're fairly confident that, that disallowances, the government's not going to be targeted for significant disallowance. I mean, it's not a perfect system, but... Uh the spe I think the specific disallowance, in of course, disallowance covers many, many different yes. things. Yeah. The specific disallowance that uh, was being linked to inspections was the greening inspections that, uh, that Graham mentioned. That, oh, right. uh, For example, we had to check that there's a new greening rule that says far some farmers have to grow three different crops. Now, if you inspect too late and what you see is a ploughed field and you can't prove what crop was there, then, then the European Commission would say that's an inadequate inspection, you will have some disallowance. So that's why that, uh, that July date was important to get the greening inspections done. As it happened... Europe, in a spirit of helpfulness, uh, quite late in the day, said, actually, we'll change the guidance on what evidence you can uh, take into account. So, whereas initially we thought our inspectors had to see a field of barley 
to be able to say that field was barley. Late on, the Commission said actually crop residue would suffice. So if there was barley stubble and bits of odd barley ear that had dropped off the trailer around the field, late on in the day, the Commission said um, that will suffice as evidence that that field was barley. Well, it's an example of the, the moving goalposts that we've had to deal with uh, all the way through. I mean, I can see them actually having photographs with a day's newspaper in it yeah. and actually sending you. Yeah. Just, yes, I won't go on. Chair. Yeah. And <laughs> finally, Nigel Dine. Convener, a couple of questions, if I might. Could I just go back to, to the basic idea of, of, of ICT systems? Uh, you mentioned, I think, earlier on wage elasticity of 32%. Is that, is that right? It sort of rises, rises in, in wages in, 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 in costs of what I've got down here is 32%. Um, maybe, maybe you didn't. Maybe it was the previous panel. Forgive me. Okay, yeah. in which case that shows yeah. what happens over a long meeting. But either way, uh, yeah. sorry, but this is relevant to you nonetheless. Um, how on earth do you account for that kind of thing? Is it, is it, when you're managing these kind of programs, is there any possibility of getting those kind of numbers right? Are, are we asking you to do the impossible? Um, if, if I can clarify what I, I, I said for Mr. Don's benefit, the example we got from our, our principal contractor is, is that software developers are now commanding 32%, 32%, higher rates yeah. uh, than we had envisaged in the contract. Yes. And you know, it, it, it's very difficult uh, when you're managing something to, to allow for that. I think skills have been uh, uh, an issue for us in terms of the rates we are paying through our principal contract with CGI for their staff and the people they take on. Um, and you know, it was also, as the previous evidence we gave to the committee showed, it was challenging in taking on the very senior people that mm -hmm. we need to lead the programme. That took us time um, more than money, but it's, um, you know, it's a hot market and it's difficult to, to deal with that. Okay, so it's difficult. Um, could I then just come back to this point about December payments? Um, I, I still don't think I understand why it's not possible to make a payment to every farmer. Is there not some minimum defensible payment that you could make? No, Mr. Price is nodding his head. I, I, I'm, I'm just uh, okay. I'm not disputing that. I'm just. I'd love to understand why is there the case that there's a farmer out there whose his, his, his entitlement is so uncertain that it might be zero? Because surely that's the only circumstance under which you can't pay him. Right, sure. yeah. the, the, the issue is that the um, European Commission regulations are very clear about what we have to have done in, before we can make a payment to an individual farmer. And for a payment to an individual farmer, we need to have completed all of the application processing, all of the, all of the administrative checks that we do, um, as well as the um, field, the on-the-spot field, in, field inspections. So under all of this, there is no relaxation no. Um, to enable us to make a payment to that to any any, any farmer that's going to get a field inspection. Um, we cannot pay that farm until all those all those inspections are done, um, and all of those processes have been have been completed. Um, you, you're you're quite right that um, there is a there is a number that that we have to try to calculate um, once we've done all the inspections. Um, before we know what the final payment to a farmer will be, and that's why we're that's why we're looking at the two the two part payment essentially making a, a partial payment as early as we can. Uh, but as I say, ultimately we need to have completed all all of our administrative checks and all of the inspections in order to be able to to make a payment to each individual farmer. And my worry, just coming back to the point of disallowance, is that you know as Jonathan said, if we don't comply by the rules, then we get a blanket correction. Yes. Put in us. Which, at the end of the day, everybody pays for. One way, but we yes. nationally finish yes. up paying for. So it is yes. actually not in our collective interest yep. to fiddle the figures, as it were, for any individual, however and, much we might like to. And, and we have a, a pretty good record. I mean, in, in the current programme, our disallowance has been about 1%, which um, you know, puts us in, well on the league table in Europe, and it's about half 
the rate of the rest of the UK. Right. So I've, I have the balance as accountable officer of getting that number as low as possible, but also trying to get money out to people as quickly as possible. And that's the judgment we'll take with our ministers when we have an idea of what the risk is. I use the term fiddling the fiddles. <laughs> fiddling the figures merely as a way of saying we don't stick to the rules. Forgive me. Uh, that's jargon. I thank the panel for thank the you. time this morning. And can I just remind colleagues that we'll be discussing this item in agenda item number six uh, in private. Uh, can I just allow a brief suspension to allow the witnesses to leave the table? Number four, which is consideration of a response from the Scottish Government to a letter from the committee regarding the AGS report on broadband. Uh, do members have any comments? Can I just can I ask colleagues for comments on the, the, some other, co the, other colleagues? Yeah, for an agenda item number four. four. And so I'm asking for colleagues to comment on the letter that's been received. Can I just ask colleagues if there's any conversations that take place outside, please? Thank you. Okay, so we have Colin Beatty. Yeah, I've had a look through the responses and so on. This is obviously a, a very important issue that's not going to go away. And I think as far as it goes, we've probably got as much as we can at this point. I think there's been some quite good work done on this by the committee. But I think we should probably note this response. But I think we should also understand when would be the best time to come back on this. Because this is going to go on for probably several years yet. And we need to be sure that the implementation is going well and that we're getting, we're getting delivered for what is a lot of money that's going into it from the government that we're getting good value for that. <laughs> so we suggest that maybe we should, uh, at some point, talk to Audit Scotland. I think uh, we talked to Audit Scotland about this later. I can't remember now. Uh, no. Audit Scotland? Yeah. Sorry, sorry, Commissioner. I thought there was a suspension there, so my apologies for discussing it, discussing uh, agriculture. Um, can I agree with that? I just think um, what Mary and I really found out about Community Broadband, Broadband Scotland on this is that um, their role is very limited because BT will not give clarity on which areas are going to be invested in and which are not. And that rolls and rolls and rolls. So Colin, Colin's point is absolutely right. It would be very helpful if Audit Scotland would continue to look very closely at this um, because we can do what we can as individual representatives, but, but we can do with keeping Audit Scotland pressure on this. Stuart Miller and Mary uh, Thank you, I agree with, with uh, colleagues, but I'd like to add that um, it, it, it kind of struck me uh, when I was reading this particular paper that uh, there's probably a planning role uh, in this as well that uh, I think the Audit Scotland uh, might want to consider, uh, particularly when there are uh, new facilities being uh, built, uh, we, uh, whether it's through kind of regeneration projects or whatever, and in terms of the, the, the linkage uh, and uh, and and uh, the improved connectivity to these new facilities. Uh, so a constituent has contacted me regarding a, a new facility, and there is no superfast broadband actually uh, uh, basically into the, in that particular building. So there's probably a planning uh, a locus in this uh, issue as well uh, to, to consider going forward. Ms. Cameron. Yes, I, th I think you know I read the government's response, and it was really probably as expected. And you know they did respond to all the questions, but it still remains that uh, you know the uncertainty in the future. And what Davy Scott and I heard on Mull was that you know people's businesses were being affected. It wasn't just you know keeping in touch with uh, friends by email. I mean, it's a huge tourism area uh, within the islands, and very difficult for them to uh, promote tourism in the way that can be promoted elsewhere. But I think the most disappointing thing is that, you know, for all the work that was done within a group of islands, and it took huge amounts of time, BT could not come forward with any date or time of when they would be introducing better super-fast broadband. And one chap that I asked a question, 
uh, after three years of meetings and ferries around the islands, BT could just come forward and say, oh, well, we'll bring it in tomorrow. And so I think the government have answered as best they can, and I think it's fine. I think they've taken some time to address the issues, but I do agree with Colin. We need a very watchful eye on this. We just seem to be so hampered by BT's lack of certainty in the future, and I, I still can't believe that we can't come forward with a, a better way of working with communities and bring forward some certainty so that, as Stuart McMillan says, there can be better planning for the future, and that seems to be the best way forward. Um, so, Can I just make one point in terms of just a few observations before I bring Stuart McMillan in? A, that I actually think the consumers losing in this yeah. the whole debate. Yeah, uh, you know, in terms of feedback I receive from constituents, uh, there's frustration. I think Shumi Mom makes a good point about new build developments uh, where people are advised in the sales cabin, don't worry about it, you're going to get broadband, you're yeah. going to get super fast broadband. What speed do you want? Oh, it'll be up to whatever you need. You know, be, people get promised the earth in these sales cabins, and I know then the providers have to pick up in that. Uh, but I'm not convinced that given all this competition that's meant to be there, the market people keep getting... I mean, I know in where I live, we get literature through every week, or oh, Virgin can do this for you, BT can do this. And then when you contact Virgin, they say, well, we don't provide a service in that area. Uh, and, in fact, we're not interested in coming into that area because it's not economically feasible for us to come in. Uh, so then we have the issue of BT, which is that we have gaps in various areas where people are advised they're too far away from the exchange. They're told that it's in the pipeline, but they've been told that for the last three, four years. Uh, so I think, you know, given that these companies receive quite significant public subsidy for the work that they do, uh, I'm not convinced that we get work. Uh, we get we, we get the payback from that that we do get for the investment that we make. And I think the market actually dictates the, the pace, as in the providers are doing that. And I'm not convinced that the government uh, are able to, uh, or I think there needs to be a willingness to, to take it forward to make sure that the money that's going into this uh, across the UK and it's significant sums of money. This is this is not. I mean, this is in a scale uh, that you know. If we were investing this money in supermarkets, so if we said to Tesco, we're going to give you 100 million pounds to give people free food, then you know. Tesco would be doing very well at it, and this is the case here. We're actually giving these providers money to provide an infrastructure, and I'm not convinced that we get it back for what we should. But I think we're moving away, and I'm doing it as well. In terms of the report, uh, that's quite a specific remit from the AGS. Uh, I think commenting on it, but saying that with a heavy heart, there appears to be uh, only so far we can take the report. So, shoot me more there. Yeah. Yeah, no, thank you. It was really just was a point of clarification that uh, my comments were regarding the planning system, not about planning per se in terms of how yeah. things are yeah. at the moment. It was mostly about the planning system and any kind of potential planning gain uh, yeah. for any developments. Yeah. 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 Uh, Convener, I'm, I'm absolutely with you. I think there are two sides to this. Uh, quite simply, we need to keep an eye on this as an audit committee because large sums of public money are being spent yeah. and we need to encourage the Auditor General to look at that on a regular basis. I suspect annually, but if somebody comes up with a number number, that says maybe. But of course the other thing is we do just need to make sure that the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee or whoever it is in the next Parliament is looking at the policies behind this. It, it's, it's not our remit, but it very firmly is there. I mean, you get things through the door telling you that you know, this, that or the other supplier will do things. I have tens of thousands of constituents who wouldn't get that leaflet because they're too far away anyway. Yeah. Nobody would ever pretend that we're going to get a fast broadband. Colin Beattie and then Richard Simpson. Sorry, Colin. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, uh, sorry. Thanks. Um, no, I totally agree with a lot that's been said, but coming back to what Stuart McMillan said in terms of the planning aspect and these regional plans that come in, a lot of them don't take in the infrastructure. They just tell you where you're building. Effectively, that that really, if business is still to be considered in uh, areas of high development, this is the sort of thing that we need to know and who's paying for it and all the rest of it. Perfect example is outside Edinburgh. As soon as you pass Edinburgh Airport, you fall off a cliff in terms of broadband pr provision. People at Kirkliston have been screaming out for it. It's killing businesses out there the whole lot, and it's only a matter of minutes uh, from Edinburgh. So it's not just places like, you know, the islands and whatever. But, and there's also the issue of making sure there's no more, watch my language, but the uh, more, no more mess-ups like there was in, uh, I think it was Edinburgh, Aberdeenshire, somewhere like that, about state aid rules, that uh, there was um, 
uh, going to be provision uh, in terms of broadband, and it all fell foul of that. Uh, so what's happening from UK government, Scottish government, and the plans through BT planning system, it all needs to be taken into consideration as a winner. Okay, and finally, Richard Simpson. Well, I agree with again with what much as what has been said. I, I, I mean, it seems to me that the, the promises that are made are not being fulfilled. That the, the speed broadband speeds uh, are, are often fluctuate. Uh, the, you know, with the with the volume of users that are on, you can get it very well at one point of the day, and then another point of the day you actually get almost no service whatsoever. Uh, so there, there's a capacity issue in there as well, and it seems to me that we. I mean, if you look at Japan, they don't. When they talk about super broadband, super fast broadband, they're talking about a gigabyte, not not a hundred megabytes, or as we're talking about, as I gather, up to eighty-four megabytes. I mean, that's not super fast. That's moderately decent, you know. And and with the amount of with the amount of streaming that's coming on, and with the amount that you know the demand for streaming amongst the next generation. Uh, you know, to talk about th this is, is just not going to meet it. So I think we should be asking the Infrastructure Committee not only that we'll keep a close eye on what's happening at the moment, but is actually our investment going to in any way future-proof us? <coughs> is any way going to keep us competitive? Because if we don't have gigabyte speed, and then particularly for our businesses, you know, we're not going to actually succeed. We're not going to be a successful country. Okay. Uh, so we've agreed to note it, but also uh, well, I think we've, we've suggested as well that we refer it to the Infrastructure Committee. Is that agreed then, colleagues? Yes, agreed. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I then move on and, as agreed, uh, move the committee into the private session for the next items and allow for a very short uh, suspension?